Hi there, folks, and welcome to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Zev Nakajima again. Great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you also for your concerns. We've received quite a few emails and calls from people wondering if we are okay, since we're based in Fukuoka City, which is in Kyushu, Japan's uh, southwestern landmass. And this area has been hit by severe floods and mudslides in the past week or so. So yes, we're fine. Thank you again for your concern. Here in the city, things are not really that bad. There were a few mudslides and evacuations of some streets, but no casualties that I'm aware of, fortunately. In uh, Kumamoto and a few other prefectures, about two hours south of here, though, there has been loss of life. Um, around 60 people dead so far and many, many more missing and presumed dead. About 80,000 emergency personnel are doing really spectacular work, saving so many more lives on a daily basis. And hundreds, if not thousands of homes have been completely devastated. Uh, the rains have finally, for now at least, stopped or mostly stopped. So things are starting to look a little bit better again. But this is rainy season in Japan, which means we're probably due for at least a few more of these crazy downpours in the next month or so. Hopefully nothing is bad, but if you are living in Japan, and particularly here in Kyushu, you do need to stay alert, follow up on current weather conditions, maps, uh, evacuation warnings as they come. Make sure you're well ahead of these floods, if at all possible, and stay safe. Okay, so for today's episode, as you might have noticed, the combination of more readily available loans, which we've discussed here uh, for both residents and non-residents of Japan, as well as prices having taken a temporary hit in some major cities uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And also maybe a little bit counterintuitively, but still a factor, the fact that prices have gone up significantly, um, or at least held steady in most places in the last six, seven years leading into this current pandemic-generated uh, slump. These have all combined to create the perfect storm, pardon my pun, which enables people to look beyond the typical low capital cash only type purchase of condo units and we now see more and more people purchasing buildings now we deal with mainly private investors whether they're individuals or couples uh, family offices or various small to medium companies so the buildings that our clients normally end up purchasing are on the smaller scale so two to five floors in most cases um, anywhere between two to ten or maybe 20 units at most mm -hmm. And these units can be of various profiles, so purely residential or purely commercial, like small office blocks or shop blocks, uh, often a nice and diverse combination of both, meaning residential buildings with ground floor shops or offices or mixed purpose buildings with both residential and commercial units, a unit that can be used for both purposes. So today's conversation is with a new client who's looking into that type of investment, so small buildings preferably mixed residential commercial. Now, this guy is going to get his permanent residency here in a couple of months, so he's got more options open to him as far as financing goes. But as we've mentioned a few weeks ago when we did an update episode on the uh, financing environment for non-residents in Japan, there are more options available now for non-residents as well, with or without the need to incorporate in Japan, depends on what you're buying and which lender you're going for. And even incorporating here in Japan is not really that big of an issue. It can actually be beneficial for tax purposes, uh, depending on your individual circumstances, of course, and the planned size of your portfolio. So we'll link again to that episode as well in the show notes. Uh, and in this call that you'll hear today, we discuss these types of investments, buildings, tax, financing implications, run over some current samples of buildings that are available on the market, uh, and of course, talk about how we can help as well in our role as, as buyers, agents, and portfolio managers. So here's that call. I uh, hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you again on the other side. I'm also investing in Europe uh, in real estate, and that's mostly, let's say, high yield. So one thing I'm doing is, uh, is Airbnb type. Uh, so already furnished uh, studio, one bedroom, mostly one bedroom, uh, in, in the south, southern of Europe. And also I'm looking at buying some uh, whole buildings and break them down. Uh, basically, first floor is business oriented, uh, kind of uh, kind of property, and then uh, top well from the second Japanese second floor uh, to the uh, well highest floor, uh, which is rented out. Residential, so, uh, you mean? Yes. Yeah. So something also I would be interesting at looking at in 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 Japan. Uh, I've had a quick look in uh, in Tokyo. That's totally well. Hard to do. <laughs> Not cheap. <laughs> yeah, 
let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> let's say that. Um, so, well, having, uh, I don't really have the time and expertise or the time to build the expertise to look around, uh, I mean, of all the uh, second tier cities in Japan to see where that would make most sense and what kind of, uh, well, which location would be available for, let's say, a mid-sized budget, budget with a, enough uh, visibility as to getting tenants and, uh, and good cash flow. When you say mid-sized budget, what kind of budget are we talking about? Let's say in Tokyo, I haven't found really anything less than $1 million. Yeah. Uh, and, and even at $1 million, you'd have, well, it's not, it's not really a good thing. So I'm more thinking around, let's say, 500, 600, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of budget. Okay, well, we just had a bit of a research done for another customer on exactly the same topic. So if you give me a minute, I'll just have a look at the results. And then I should be able to give you some samples of what's doable in other cities. Just give me a sec. Sure. Um, okay, so the cheapest I saw in Tokyo, and this is just a five-unit building with one office on the ground floor and then four residential units on top. And that one is $88 million. So mm -hmm. about, uh, let's call it 800,000 US. Um, and then I've got one in Yokohama that's actually quite reasonable. So four units, one shop, one office, and so just two floor building, one shop. Oh, no, sorry, four floor building. It's one unit per floor. And you got one shop, one office, and two rooms, two 1Ks. And that one is... Um, 65,800, so just about six, what, 660,000 or so? Yeah, something like that. Um, that one's residential, residential, residential. Just give me a sec. Um, okay, there's one in Osaka, which is 77 million. And that one has one office and six rooms. And um, you're not interested in completely commercial, are you? Uh, in fully commercial buildings? Yeah, well, small ones. I mean, just, you know, two offices and one shop or just a three floor building with one shop or one office per floor kind of thing. situation <laughs> yeah businesses are closing these days it might might be wise to wait a little bit <laughs> yeah but i mean you know the upside of the current situation is that they are cheaper now yeah right yeah okay and then i've got another one in tokyo again just under 89 million which is one shop and six units okay and Another one in Tokyo, again, same price, 88 million, uh, one office and three bedroom, uh, three units, three residential units. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one in Tokyo for 70 more, 74 and a half million, actually, that's the cheapest one. Um, and that was built in 2016. That's a really nice one. One office, four one room units. That's in uh, Koto. Yeah. And anything else to so bear with me? Okay, that's just two shops, so wholly commercial again. And no, that's it. That's what I've got. So maybe Yokohama, maybe even Osaka. I think definitely Nagoya and Fukuoka would probably have deals. Maybe not quite 50 million, but maybe something closer to 60, 70. Mm -hmm. uh, that would probably suit what you're looking for. And these were all built um, 2000 and later, so they're all in pretty good shape. Interesting. So it's doable. If you don't mind specifically Tokyo, uh, it is doable. Even in Tokyo, I mean, what, what's your uh, maximum budget? You said, we said not 10 million, or not, um, not 100 million, but what's your maximum? Yeah, so that would also really depend on the on the bank as well, because uh, that's gonna that's not gonna be a cash uh, purchase for that. So, well, I mean, 
considering the fact that you're going to be buying something that's already more than 50 million, I would guess, um, yeah. it might be a good idea to set up a company. Yeah. And then even if you don't have residency, um, you could get a loan uh, from uh, Shinsei Investment and Finance and that but the the terms wouldn't be as good as a native japanese loan so you're looking at somewhere between three to four percent interest mm -hmm. and uh 60 to 70 percent ltv so you will need to put in 30 to 40 percent in cash yeah so if that's doable for you you don't have to wait for residency they will give you a loan well i should get the residency in two months so Okay, well, that, that's not an issue. But, but did your bank actually tell you that they lend for a commercial uh, mixed property? I have uh, this Eon Bank uh, could be a possibility for that. Okay. But uh, it's uh, it's only eighty percent uh, loan to value, so I still have to put uh, two percent down payment. It's not a bad thing, man. It's not good to be a hundred percent leveraged, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, things things go downhill, you're suddenly going to be uh, putting sure. up, yeah. Sure, yeah, that's, that's always a possibility here. Mm. Uh, you're right. Uh, well, as well, as well, but... Uh, okay, well, I didn't know about the Shinsei on... Uh, but, um, okay. But what, what's Eon um, interest rates like? The uh, last time I asked them for that, it was around 2.5. Well, that that's not that much worse. Uh, that that much better than uh, Shinsei. That's only about Shinsei will go three three and a half percent. So it's not a disaster. Okay, so Eon and Eon said that um, Eon said that uh, mixed purpose is okay. They don't they don't mind shops and offices and so forth. Uh, I only asked them uh, the general question about uh, about the building. Mixed use, but I haven't given them uh, too many details, so it, it's just a pre, uh, pre, pre okay discussion. There is no, I, I, I do not have yet, as you know, since I haven't given them the property, uh, the the official um, loan template. But they're open to it. They're open to it. Yeah. Okay, that that's great to hear. Okay. Using using some connections. <laughs> ah, okay. So it's not something you can just walk off the street and get. Mm, Probably not. <laughs> You should uh, you should make a business of that one. I know a lot of people that will go for that. <laughs> That's a possibility. <laughs> getting getting a few percent is a few percent out of it. Yeah, there's people doing that. I mean, the, the Japan doesn't have too many of those, but uh, mortgage brokers is a very uh, very profitable job in other countries. Yes, that, that's one of our, of the questions that I was asking myself. Why not so many? Why this industry is not really existing here? It's, uh, it's kind of funny. Well, because the selection is pretty limited here in comparison with other countries. So it's usually only the, I mean, there are a few private lenders, um, commercial lenders, but it's mostly the banks. And then they all have specific location criteria. So Eon and UFJ, for example, are nationwide. Um, and a few other, a few of the other mega banks are as well. But the rest of them are very local banks that will only lend for their particular areas. And they like to do business with locals as well. So just, I mean, getting becoming a mortgage broker in Japan means you have to work with very specific small selection of banks. So I'm guessing it's not as profitable as in other countries. Um, but I haven't I haven't really delved into it. I don't know to tell you a clear answer about that one. <laughs> so I'd say that's uh, that's about it uh, in what I have in mind for uh, for Japan as of now. Okay, so how, how can we help? Do you want us to what send you samples or listings in Japanese or in English or Excel sheet uh, uh, deal analysis? What what can we do for you? Well, how do you work usually? Uh, I mean, I remember the, the talk like three years ago, but uh, I, I do think many things happened. <laughs> um, well, our model hasn't changed much. So we, we act as a buyer's agent for the uh, purchase purpose. So we represent you, we do the research, we do the due diligence, we conduct negotiations if that's possible. And we work with the realtor. So we're not a realtor ourselves. We sure. represent you in front of the realtors and our fee comes on top. But um, I think most of our customers would agree that we help them save a lot more than our fee is worth. And then, depending on how uh, happy and comfortable you are actually attending the uh, signing meetings, um, you know, receiving the uh, explanation of important matters, which has to be done 
um, yeah. 100% in Japanese and, and pretty Keigo-ish Japanese at that. Um, so we can, if you give us permission to, we can represent you in those meetings as well. So you don't actually have, um, have to attend in person with an interpreter or, you know, if the company happens to be in Fukuoka, you don't have to fly over to Fukuoka and that sort of thing. And then we'll do everything up to the point where you finish settlement and you've got a property manager in place and the property starts generating income directly into your bank account. And then on the management side, it depends on whether you need us or not. So if you're happy communicating with the property managers on your own, receiving their monthly report and paying the um, uh, paying all the fees, insurance companies, um, building management companies in case you buy in a co-owned unit and that sort of thing. If you're happy doing all of that on your own, then you probably don't need us after settlement. Um, otherwise, we can also do the portfolio management portion for you and do everything. Okay. And we charge... Um, for the budget that you're talking about, we would be charging 3% on the purchase okay. and um, 2% on the management, 2% of the gross rental income on the management. On the, on the purchase, that's the gross excluding uh, retail, retail fee, right? Just the actual listing price, not, not um, yeah. So we charge 3% of whatever the uh, property price is. And then the realtors charge what they charge, which is 3% plus 60,000 plus tax. Okay. And 2% of growth, uh, that's income for, for rental management. Huh? For the 2% of the gross rental income. So we don't charge if the property is vacant or if one of the units is vacant, we don't, uh, yeah. we don't add that to our fee. Um, but same as the property managers that we work with, we do charge a small placement fee when we put a new tenant in there. So the property managers charge um, 5% monthly. Yeah. And then they charge the first one or two months uh, of rental income when they place a new tenant, depending on how easy it was, if they had to share the listing with other property managers and so forth. And we charge half a month on populating a new property. One to two months is for them on populating and half a month for you, right? Correct. Okay. okay. Are you working with uh, set property managers or how, how is this? Uh... Uh, we do, but we do occasionally have to replace them. They do stuff up on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing is that our customers, um, the ones who have signed up with us usually prefer not to have to start searching for a new property manager and not to have to chase them up for renovation quotes and stuff like that. So we do all of that on their behalf. And then we um, we just replace the PM if he's not doing a good job. And we've got a list, especially in the bigger cities, we've got a big list of um, PMs that we work with on a regular basis. So there's usually a pretty smooth transition if we do have to replace them. Okay. Um, all right, so in terms of... Um Identification for properties. Do you have uh, any kind of uh, set, let's say, uh, requirement uh, file, Excel file type of, uh, of document you'd like to, you need us to fill? How, how you work on that? Say, for example, for this, uh, for the kind of uh, the building we talked about. Yep. Um, do I need to, to, to give you more details uh, on top of the budget, number of units, cash flow? How do you do that? Um, well, it would help. I mean, if the buildings that I've mentioned now, for example, if something that we've already researched for another customer also suits your criteria, we're always happy to forward samples to you. Sure. So you can review them. But once you want us to start conducting due diligence and contacting agents and sellers and um, making offers on your behalf um, or to do more research and find more properties, at that point we have to be engaged. So you have to pay us our fee estimate in advance. And then uh, we credit or debit that based on whatever you ended up purchasing, whatever the actual purchase price was. I see. Okay, so there's a kind of credit. Uh, how much? How much would that be? So three percent. Three percent. Yeah. So if budget. you say that your budget, we can take the uh, lower end of your budget. So if you say that your budget is, for example, between uh, the places that you've been looking at and the properties you've been looking at, probably started about sixty million. So if you say that your budget is uh, somewhere between 60 to 80 million, we'll charge you 3% of 60 million. And then post settlement, if you ended up settling on something that's actually 80 million, then we'll debit you the difference. Okay, so 3% paid up front? Of the budget, not of the actual purchase price, because we don't know that yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Right. So, uh, so for example, in case uh, the deal doesn't go through, uh, for example, because of financing, what happens? 
Oh, we, we keep representing, to, representing you until you end up settling. There's no limit on the uh, amount of work that we spend. Okay. All right. So you could, uh, I mean, a lot of our customers submit uh, five or six or ten applications before they actually end up settling. We, we're there for the single fee. We don't charge you again. with some specific banks as well? Um, the banks that we're in touch with are usually for the purpose of non-resident loans. So Shinsei Investment and Finance that I've mentioned, and um, there's a Singapore bank, UOB, that we work with, and Oryx in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get your residency, it'll just be a matter of you just shopping around in person, uh, probably start with the bank that you've already worked with the most, the one that you get your salary into, for example and just uh, inquire with each and every one of them and just shop around until you get we, we don't have any advantage in that regard but we do support you with the application so we'll provide you with the listings we'll provide you with excel sheets that help them understand what the cash flow is going to be like and uh, we'll give you everything that you need but the actual communication and application for the loan you'll have to do on your own yeah. okay and you were saying regarding the uh, as per your calculations, any, anything above 50 million would make sense looking at uh, incorporating it? Yeah, just for tax purposes, once your income, if we take a conservative income of, say, uh, let's say 5%, yeah. so once you, reach, um, once you reach that income level of, um, let's say, over 20, 30,000 bucks a year, um, it does make sense to set up a corporate structure because there's a lot more that you can claim and also the individual income tax keeps rising whereas the uh, corporate tax is capped and at around uh, let me just open the tax table so I'll give you a clearer idea are you married by the way no. you are no. so you could also once you have once you've got a company in place you can also uh, pay salaries to your wife and you can also claim a lot more expenses that you wouldn't be able to claim as an individual So there's other factors there. So income tax um, in Japan um, I don't know what your annual. Oh, that's right. You're actually working in Japan. So you've already paying individual income tax That's yes. probably uh, probably not far from the uh, 23 33 percent, right? Uh, way more than that. <laughs> yeah, so it would definitely be in your best interest to set up a company even for a lower amount then because that's all going to be added to your individual income right yeah i mean that's one that's one point but you do have also the uh, depreciation on the uh, on the other end right and uh, no for that you'll need to speak to an accountant that's not something that I can help with but um i mean purchase cost you can carry forward for 5 years if you've got a company or as it's only for 3 years as an individual mm. And I think the purchase cost plus the income tax threshold that you'll um, that you'll be looking at once you um, purchase a, a bigger property that'll probably take you up a lot more than the depreciation would. But again, I'm not an accountant, so I'll put you in touch with one who can probably uh, give you a bit more uh, clear info on that. Okay, thanks. Because yeah. the, uh, the uh, this guy, I mean, currently my I'm almost at the top of the uh, of the income tax bracket. Okay. And that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so, so on a, on a percentage wise, it would not change anything, but uh, depreciation could uh, could change a lot. So that's why maybe there is a. Uh, it could make sense to structure it two different ways: one to to claim the depreciation under you know, personal income tax, and the other one set up a company with more of the, um, uh, let's say, building income generating buildings. Uh, on the other side, and claiming the, the wooden expenses for the, uh, let's say, machia, kyoto machia uh, kind of uh, okay. house. Gotcha. Well, for, for that sort of creative accounting, that's um, beyond my pay grade, so I'll need to put you in touch <laughs> with someone. Excellent. All right, so on, the, on that one, uh, if you can, uh, I mean, uh, give me the introduction to, to, to the, your accountant. Yep. I'll, dis I'll discuss with him, uh, see what can work out, and then after, uh, I mean, that should be probably first thing <laughs> in yeah. setting up the plan well I'll, um, I'll put you in touch with a couple of them you can try one of them uh, costs a little bit more but he does tend to dish out more free advice even before you pay him okay so maybe try both of them and see who you feel more comfortable with thanks very much appreciate it no worries. um regarding all right so i do think you would have also um so sort of, uh, quite a standard contract 
with a, a description for the properties to to get engaged. A what to get us engaged? How do you operate? How do you operate? So you have a you have a standard contract. Yep. Yeah. So we have a contract of services and a limited power of attorney document, which is what enables us to represent you. And we need those signed and uh, we need your Hanko stamped on those and the Hanko certificate attached uh, in Kanchome. Sure. And um, I mean, samples we can send you at any point if we have them. So we, I can send you property samples to look at regardless of the engagement process. Okay. And then so, once you want us to start digging deeper <coughs> into anything or to start making inquiries and due diligence and so forth, then we need our fee paid. Okay. So what I would suggest... Uh, could you send me some samples? Uh, so for the uh, buildings we, we talked about, let's yep. say of um, the fifty million kind of uh, the research you did for your for your clients, that would be pretty much it for me. Uh, I have a look at these. Uh, if you can send me as well the the engagement contract, so that I have a look at it. Yep. So that that's gonna be because uh, uh, that would be done. Uh, then I discuss with the accountant. I uh, refine. Uh, the criteria also for the search. Yep. Uh, give you a bit more um, pinpoint uh, kind of targets. Uh, moving, and then uh, yeah. Uh, from there. Should hear about the residency, the age again about beginning of next month. Yep. Almost process. So uh, I would like to wait until then uh, to really to to sign anything because that would change a lot of things on the on the contracts. I mean on the on the loan side. And uh, as we as we've seen, that's quite a few percent percent in uh, in terms of uh, interest. So that's that's quite a lot of money down the road. Yeah. Just as a side note, when was the last time you spoke to Ian about these loans? Ha! Huh. Uh, beginning of a year. So before before the corona. Before the corona. It might be a good idea to uh, revisit that. <laughs> Yeah. I know that a lot of them have been uh, have been narrowing their criteria and uh, have been only doing particular locations and only doing particular types of borrowers once the corona started. Mm. Um, so things might have changed a bit. You might want to chase them up again and see, uh, even in principle, just see if anything's changed. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, just uh, another to do thing on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the long to do list. No yeah. worries. It, it, it's. Um... I think worldwide has been exactly the same as well. Uh, banks have been uh, getting cold feet a little bit, yeah. but I haven't seen haven't seen any significant drop in prices on the market. Have you? Yes, we have actually. I'm surprised uh, you're saying that. Yeah. I mean, in Tokyo. Uh, in Tokyo. In Tokyo, especially in Tokyo. Really? Yeah, we've seen at least uh, ten to twenty percent. Well, even if they're not listed for less, they're much more negotiable than they were before. And uh, we've seen yields, uh, prices and yields go up, uh, prices go down and yields go up. So, you know, we saw properties in uh, central Shinjuku and areas yep. like that that are yielding 6% net pre-tax or six and a half. Mm. And we haven't seen that for a good five, six years. So yeah, in Nagoya as well, we've seen properties really go down significantly. Fukuoka, not so much. And Osaka, probably somewhere in between. So Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and when I say Tokyo, I'm including Yokohama, Kawasaki, that sort of place. Mm, great Tokyo. Um, they've they've definitely gone down in price, or at least are a lot more negotiable than they were. Mm. And you're talking about uh, second-hand properties, right? Not, not brand new ones. Huh? Yes, so uh, we, we don't have any customers looking for brand new ones now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and these across the board, meaning whole buildings to uh, small. One, one unit. Yeah. yeah, like I like I told you, I mean, seventy-seven million for an entire building yeah. in Tokyo. We've we've never that's seen cheap. anything like that up to uh, five, six years ago. So. I agree, I agree. Yeah. That's, that's really cheap, of course. Well, that's Kotoku, but still. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. So I think that's about it. So Ziv, what I do is I talk to the guys in Kyoto, try to get you more information. That'd be good. Uh, on uh, on the Airbnb thing. Uh, I discuss with uh, with the two accountants uh, once you've done the, the introduction. Yep. Um, if you can send me some so some of the samples regarding these uh, whole buildings we've been talking about, I will I will look at it and the draft contract, and then I suggest I would discuss also with uh, with Eon Bank and the other banks uh, in the middle, seeing what they will say, 
and uh, suggest we talk maybe again. Oh, I send you an email uh, once I have more news. Yep. Uh, uh, somewhere maybe beginning, either begin uh, end of the month, beginning of next month. Uh, once also I have uh, some news about the AG can. Sounds good. And with the samples, you want only mixed use properties, yeah? Uh, maybe a whole residential, I mean, residential only as well. Okay, no worries. We'll be fine. All right, I'll get those to you. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so there you have it. That call hopefully helped shed some more light on what's available in the market at the moment, uh, buildings-wise at least, and also lay down the groundwork uh, required for getting started with these investments. So we'll link in this episode's show notes uh, to the uh, financing episode that we did recently as discussed, and also to a sample spreadsheet containing some of these samples as well. And we haven't really touched upon some of the other cities, so Nagoya, Fukuoka, Kobe, etc., all places that could be even cheaper to buy into and yield even higher returns. So if you're interested in these locations as well, don't be shy, drop us a line, and we'll send you some more info and samples on those as well. And while you're dropping us a line, we would really love to hear from you on this or any other topic as well. So leave us your comments in the comment section of wherever you might have found this podcast, or email us directly on info at nippontradings.com. That's N-I-P-P-O-N Tradings with an S, all one word, info at nippontradings.com. We're always happy to hear from you. So that's it from uh, for today from us here at NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. Our theme song is by Kevin Hartnell of Overlook Hotel Records. Check out his work as well. Stay safe and dry. If you're living in Japan, make sure you're on top of any evacuation notices in your area. And of course, do subscribe to our podcast. If you found this content interesting, share it with your networks. And we would really love it if you could leave us a short review or even just a star rating on the iTunes store. Spotify, help us spread the good word. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, Yoroshiku. Yoroshiku.